Are we broadcasting? Um, okay. Thank you all for joining us here to discuss Jim Pethokoukas' excellent new book. Thanks to everyone who's joining us uh, in person. Thanks to everyone who's joining us over the live stream. And thanks to everyone who will watch this video, the video of this conversation, uh, at their convenience at some point in the future. I'm Michael Strain. I'm Director of Economic Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to, to welcome all of you. I'm uh, most happy to welcome Jim Pethokoukas to the stage. Jim, of course, is the editor of the AEI Ideas blog. Jim is a CNBC contributor. Jim uh, writes a terrific Substack newsletter that I would encourage all of you to check out and subscribe to. The uh, topics and themes that Jim writes about in his Substack are uh, obviously very related to the topics and themes of this book. Um, and uh, that, of course, is what brings us here today. Jim has written a terrific book, The Conservative Futurist, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised. Um, it is October 10th. It's a little crisp outside. True. I'm starting to see some... <laughs> Wow. Uh, I'm starting to see some uh, Christmas sales. Not too early to think about no. this book as a stocking stuffer. No reason not to give it out at Halloween as well. It's not frightening, but, you know, a little kid comes to your door, wants some candy, just, you know, plunk one of these in there for, for mom and dad. You probably want to buy 10 or 20 of them just to make sure you have enough. Um, uh, all kidding aside, I'm uh, very enthusiastic about this book, and it's doing great, and, and, and I would recommend everybody to, to buy it and read it. The run of show for this event will be very straightforward. Jim and I are going to talk about the book. Um, we'll take questions from the in-person audience. The virtual audience is very welcome to submit questions. You can submit them over X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag conservative... Futurism, conservative futurist. Better just double tag. The, uh, the, tag. The, 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 the correct hashtag is on the web page for this event. You're also welcome to email questions uh, to Josiah Johnson and his email address. Uh, the spelling of his email address is on the web page for this event, along with the correct hashtag to submit your questions over social media. Um, and so with that housekeeping out of the way, uh, Jim? Let me uh, begin by, um, there's so much to talk about. Let me begin by telling you. It's a long book. Uh, it's a long book, a lot of words. Let reads me begin, fast. Reads fast, though. Very brisk. Um, <laughs> if, it were, if, it, if we were approaching summer, I would say it's a great beach read, but you know, it's really a great Halloween read. Well, uh, for those watching in a different hemisphere, perhaps it is a, sure, be a great sure, beach sure. read. Yes, that's right. The uh, climate uh, changes, depending <laughs> on where on the globe you are. Um, let me tell you a little story about... Uh, my life. I was recently at the, because I think the focus of this conversation <laughs> should, really be, should really be on me. I'm surprised it really took this uh, long. Um, I was at the Air and Space Museum, and uh, I, I found myself thinking about your book. And right now, when you walk into the Air and Space Museum, uh, the first thing you see is... In Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., here in, here in Washington. Um, the first thing you see is the uh, original model for the Starship Enterprise created for the 1960s sci-fi television show Star Trek. Um, lots of quotes from Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek. That's right at the front door. And then when you kind of walk into the museum, uh, you see, of course, lots of exhibits about mankind's uh, pioneering journey of exploration that, that began with the Wright brothers um, and that continued uh, into the space program. And when you look at what we were able to accomplish in those six decades from uh, when the Wright brothers first took off on an airplane using bicycle technology, um, to the point where uh, President Kennedy declared that we would put a man on the moon, to the point that we actually did um, 
have astronauts walking on the moon. <clears throat> It's, it's, an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary journey. And you uh, write about that in the book. You argue that very shortly after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, we stopped. Culturally, we stopped. Um, public policy decelerated our ability to advance in that fashion, and the private sector pulled back. So I want to kind of take those two parts separately, mm -hmm. but let's, let's, let's take the first part first. So what was it that happened that allowed for a culture that created um, fiction? You know, the, the subtitle of this, of this book, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised. So science fiction plays a big role in the book. So what was it that, that created uh, a cultural moment where that kind of fiction was commercially successful and extremely popular? Um, what, what happened where uh, uh, government and public policy uh, kind of put its shoulder into economic dynamism, into innovation, into scientific progress and achievement, uh, and what happened that allowed the private sector to to uh, embrace all of that? Why why was that era so important? What what, what was the magic sauce? Well, I I, <clears throat> I think the simplest answer is that culture reflected what seemed to be happening in the real world. Um, I mean, sort of the classic bit, and perhaps the the most important bit of twentieth century futurism, uh, you know, was the you know early sixties Jetsons cartoon show. And the makers of that show did not think that they were engaging in a bit of you know, science fantasy. They, they thought that was reflecting the current trends at the time, the research the creators did, that that was actually the kind of future we were headed for. And immediately after World War II, just as the War II was ending, there was quite a bit of uh, pessimism about the future. You had famous economists saying that we we're going to go back into a Great Depression. And that didn't happen. The economy accelerated. Uh, we, we had the beginning of an atomic age, a space age. So just to look around, it seemed as if there was something new being invented every day. And that was absolutely reflected uh, you know, in the culture at the time, in the science fiction. You know, I mentioned Jetson, Star Trek, even the uh, show like 2000, a movie like 2001, A Space Odyssey. So you had sort of the culture and the economy firing on all cylinders together. And then that changed. And the big shock, in 1970, there was a book came out, it was called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. And in that book, which was a New York Times bestseller, Toffler predicted that economic growth and technological progress was going to be so rapid, it would just drive us all crazy. So the, so the, 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 the conundrum was, how do we deal with such rapid progress? So that was sort of the expectation. And the true future shock was that we didn't get that. And uh, you know, several decades later, uh, Toffler told Wired Magazine, he says, well, the economists really tricked me. They got, they got it all wrong. Uh, that we didn't get this sort of, not just continued. Those rascals. The, the, the rascals. They, uh, they, they thought we had the growth problem licked, but turns out we didn't. Uh, and they thought that the rapid growth and productivity growth uh, technological progress that we saw in the 50s and 60s would not just continue, but it would accelerate. And that's not what happened. In fact, it decelerated. And, you know, it's sort of a chicken or the egg. What came first, the deceleration or the pessimism? I tend to go with the pessimism. I mean, it's not uncommon as a country gets richer that they begin to focus a lot more on the downsides of economic growth, the environmental downsides. So I think it was always... Uh, li you, know, for sure, you know, likely, if not certain, that we were going to have uh, an environmental movement. Uh, so you had just the natural, um, that's a, that natural effect of uh, a country getting richer. But then you also had a lot more came out in the 50s about, um, about radiation dangers and Hiroshima. We had a lot of books come out like Silent Spring, which really focused uh, on the economic downsides of growth. And then really, um, you also had the Vietnam War, which... Was that, which really confirmed the worst fears of the environmental movement at the time that 
uh, the combination of government and the military and big business, we're not just, we're, we're ruining the planet. And to them, napalm and Agent Orange were no different than the poisons we were uh, releasing in society. So, but sort of like culturally, everything that could go wrong went wrong. And then we had an actual uh, measurable deceleration in growth, which undercut, I think, the entire sort of pro progress, future optimistic vibe of the era. So I want to dig a little more into this because one of the things about this book that I that I like the most um, and that I think is a really important contribution to the public debate is that it situate uh, it situates economic outcomes in a cultural context. And economists are very good at economic outcomes; they're not so great at culture. Cultural analysts are really good at cultural analysis; they're not so great at economics. And and I think the book does a very good job of kind of uh, uh, blending the two. And um, you know, recognizing that people kind of live life in a market society, in a culture, and that that the kind of causal arrow between uh, economic outcomes and cultural outcomes runs runs in both directions. So, you think the and so I want to spend a little more time on that. Uh, but before I do. Let me just take a poll. The audience is skewing a little younger. How many of you have seen The Jetsons? Okay. So some of you have literally never seen an episode of The Jetsons. Is that, is that, is that right? Are, how many of you are aware of The Jetsons? Okay, everybody is. So that's not so bad. Um, so It doesn't surprise me that you, that many. Uh, you, know, you don't have a, a decisive answer to this question because it's you know, ultimately extremely difficult to answer, but it sounds like you think that the kind of cultural pessimism predated the uh, downshift in economic uh, productivity. So what do you think led to the cultural pessimism? Was it you know, something as simple as, you know, okay, we've done the Jetsons, okay, we've done Star Trek, um, wow, this is a little utopian, you know, can we do something different? Uh, was it, um, as you said, you know, a, a kind of growing awareness that there are some downsides to um, some of the uh, innovation that, that we came up with in the 60s? Um, or was it just that and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is, you know, something, to, something that I thought about. You know, was it just that the 70s were a bad decade? Um, extremely high inflation, uh, coming off the heels of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., coming off the heels of the assassination of uh, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, coming uh, uh, off of a time of you know substantial social unrest and disruption, uh, you know this kind of sense that. You know, lots of crime in cities. You know, this sense that uh, this sense that you know things have gotten a little bit out of control culturally, instability in politics, instability in society. 1973 uh, Arab uh, oil embargo. You know, people have to wait in, in 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 lines to fill their car up with gas. Tons of high inflation. The government can't get inflation under control, and you know, maybe maybe Gene Roddenberry's vision for a future uh, that was as bright as Star Trek painted, or the Jetsons' vision of a future that was as kind of, you know, sparkly uh, uh, as it was, just didn't make sense. Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, one reason I wrote the book um, uh, was a paper I, I read, I think maybe in 2018, 2019, um, by an economist for, from Yale, who, who, who wrote about what he saw as a decline in sort of futuristic thinking or forward thinking in the United States. And the, he looked at sort of two bits of evidence. One uh, were um, the, the budget, you do the federal budget moving into deficit and long-term budget deficits. And he looked at less spending on infrastructure. And sort of the theory there is that both those things indicate a society that was thinking less about the long term. Uh, and he, he asked that question, like, why, you know, what happened to us? And he mentioned many of the things you just mentioned. And he didn't think that was actually an answerable question, that we, we had no way of figuring it out. 
so, uh, you know, I take my best shot at it. I certainly think you have sort of this, this economic downshift, super important. Uh, you have all the other sort of societal problems. But I don't think it is insignificant that what, let's say, you know, Hollywood believed about the world and the future, they were being told by experts that the future just didn't look very bright, that we were rapidly using up all the resources on the earth, uh, that we, there were too many people on the earth. Um, one, one example, you know, Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb, which made lots of predictions about overpopulation, he was on The Tonight Show, which back then was hosted by Johnny Carson, um, and everybody hero. watched The Tonight Show. A great hero. The great Johnny Carson. Uh, so, this is a, so this is a biologist from Stanford with a message of gloom. And he was on The Tonight Show uh, over 20 times preaching this exact message. So I find it hard to believe that a society that sort of soaking in pessimism, uh, and I think one example was uh, we saw in the nuclear power industry where even in the early 70s, you had people criticizing nu nuclear power as contributing to using up all the resources of the earth, and you had Three Mile Island, which uh, really you know, uh, put the um, industry in mothballs. And, 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 and when I just when I think that this is like a 70s phenomenon, I see what's going on with AI when we had this you know, perhaps really important breakthrough in artificial intelligence last November, and we all got to enjoy it for about 15 minutes talking about, gee, what can it do? How might it make the world better? And then immediately we started talking about that's going to take all the jobs, and then when it gets done taking all the jobs, uh, it's going to kill us. And we need to have a pause. We need to uh, heavily regulate it. Maybe we need to national, uh, nationalize these large language models. So this sort of pervasive gloom, and, and the news stories about AI, how often did they mention, hey, well, you may, some of you may not have heard the Jetsons, well, you've all heard the Terminator. So that became sort of the cultural touchstone when people were trying to think about this new technology and what it means for us. And I think over the long term, you cannot have a society that views technological progress as making life worse, that over the long run is going to tolerate the disruption that comes with technological change and economic growth. Uh, they're not going to tolerate that and much less invest heavily in that and think hard about how government policy slows innovation if they think ultimately all it will do is make our life worse. Something I wonder is, you know, how much of this is human nature? So, um, you know, the old saying that you'll follow a fire engine to a fire, but you won't follow a limousine to a wedding, you know? Uh, is, that, is that an old saying? It's an old saying, huh. yeah, okay. where I come from. <laughs> you and I come from the heart. <laughs> we both come from the heartland, yet I, yeah. I have not heard that saying. I, but I, I really okay. come from the heartland. Um, uh, You've been kind of corrupted by, you know, <laughs> by, the, by the big city. Out sure, here. sure. Um, Taint those roots. Here's one that maybe you'll you'll know. Yeah. Uh, plane lands oh, safely. I love, yeah, sure. Not a headline. Yeah. Right. We're now we're speaking the same. Yeah, language. yeah. That's I know this one. I've used this example. Okay. Sure. So is that it? So you know, uh, uh, is that what happened? Um, uh, AI is a good example. You know, here's a technology that could substantially uh, assist medical science in the creation of new uh, drugs and vaccines and therapeutics, uh, a technology that was used in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic to create a vaccine, uh, um, uh, a technology that is currently being used to track volcanic activity and to improve scientists' understanding of volcanic activity. Uh, volcanic activity, of course, being the most common mass extinction event uh, that occurs on the planet. Um, scientists using this technology to assist in, you got, you got a text there? Somebody, you, 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 you're, you're rocking out there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very important text. Uh, uh, very important. Uh, uh, technology that um, uh, can be used to you know, better track the paths of asteroids uh, uh, to allow um, our uh, uh, planet to, you know, prepare if there's an asteroid collision. You know, the, it seems to me that the odds of AI 
extending the longevity of the human race are substantially higher than the odds of AI leading to the, mm -hmm. the, the death of all life on Earth. Um, and yet that is not, that is not the headline. Uh, and so is there, is there something in, in human nature that leads us to uh, be concerned about the worst case scenario rather than the median scenario? Something that leads us to be concerned more about the worst case scenario than the best case scenario? And if so, why didn't we have that in the 50s and 60s? but we did have it in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, well I think if you, go to the, uh, if you go to the Wikipedia page for behavioral economics or cognitive biases, you're gonna find a lot that seem to reinforce the notion that we are sort of hardwired to sort of want the status quo, that we're hardwired to be cautious, that we feel economic losses more strongly than we feel economic gains. So I think that's part of who we are as a society. Um, and I think you know evolutionary biologists might make the, the same point. And that is why it is really important that we have a culture uh, that creates images of the future, of a future people think would be worth living in. Uh, I th again, I think that helps reinforce a, pol a, a policy environment of pro-growth, pro-progress policies, again, you know, the, with change will come disruption. People have to think it's worth it. If you look at trade, a lot of people think maybe it's not worth it. That trade between two countries, all it does is really make the United States poorer. So they, so they no longer have that image, but maybe they had around the turn of the century, uh, that, uh, that trade would create you know, more prosperity, it might reduce geopolitical tensions. So they no longer have that image. So I think if that's who we are uh, as a species, then it's even more important, I think more damaging, when that sort of natural inclination is being reinforced at every step by a culture that says, better safe than sorry. I mean, just, just recently, uh, Apple TV, so this is, so this is, you know, this isn't something from the Sunday. Apple TV had a, uh, this huge star-studded uh, miniseries called Extrapolations. Uh, where it looked at the impact of climate change over a number of decades. And uh, if you watch that, you would not know nuclear power even existed. That was never offered as a possible solution. <laughs> Instead, it just showed humanity getting worse, and by the end, uh, humanity had barely survived, and CEOs were being put on trial for war crimes. Um, I mean, that is just one example, and it was Apple, you know, Apple a lot of big name stars, you know, you know, big budgets. So that message, I mean, ignoring all the advances we're seeing with nuclear energy, maybe nuclear fusion, um, the fact that, especially after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a lot of European countries began to think a lot harder about keeping reactors open, building new reactors. Even Japan, which had a serious meltdown a decade ago, now re-embracing nuclear power. None of that was evident in that show. So year after year, movie after movie, TV series after TV series, the message is being given that tomorrow will be worse and we need to retreat, we need to live poor lives. And I'm sorry, if you live in a country where you're already poor, you will never live like the people in the West do today. So what was different about the 50s and the 60s? Why isn't that what we had then? Well, I think what happened was that, again, in the second, sort of the latter half of the Industrial Revolution, people could look around them and see, they could see progress. As I mentioned, coming out of World War II and the Great Depression, there was tons of pes pessimism. But then you know, the economy started popping, technology started popping. So I think that worked to counter that natural inclination. It was just, it was, you didn't need to be convinced that the world uh, was getting better or more prosperous. You saw it all, you saw it all around you, in fact, uh, the first chapter uh, is a lot about uh, uh, the, the opening of Disneyland and Tomorrowland. And when they opened up Tomorrowland, uh, they immediately had a problem, is that progress was moving so fast 
that Tomorrowland didn't really look particularly futuristic. Tell people what Tomorrowland is. Tomorrowland is a theme land at Disneyland, and they, they have a version of that at the other Disney parks. And the original theme land was built around a giant rocket ship. That was that was that was the. What is I'm sorry. What is theme land? Theme land. So Tell you have, me what theme you land have. Is. Uh, despite having small children, never been to the Disney parks. Uh, but they have like Adventureland, Fantasyland, uh, different different themes in the parks. I don't have. We don't have pet the cuckoo's <laughs> in my family. Disneyland is so all the Disney parks have particular theme lands, often you know hooked to the movies. Now there's kind of a new you know de facto Star Wars land, for instance. That you, you're familiar with that that very popular so, franchise. This is a kind of like exhibit that Walt Disney built. Yes. And the point was to allow guests who go to Disneyland to experience, to what, experience what life in the future would be like. Yeah, they had a frontier land too as well. You okay. could see life in the old west. I'm just trying to. Yeah, just, other lands, you could pretend to be a pirate. I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> I'm trying to help. Well, <laughs> if, you, if, wow. you, if you choose. This is, so uh, the, reading the book is, is, is an intense experience, yeah. similar to, to this. Yeah. Uh, and the, and the, and so, so the centerpiece of the uh, original Tomorrowland was a rocket, which gave a, uh, a feel for what it would be like to ride uh, uh, on, a, on a commercial rocket in the far-off year of 1986. And, but at the same time that was happening, we had an emerging space program. And uh, Walt Disney began to complain that Tomorrowland began to look like Todayland or yesterday, yesterday land, because they just couldn't keep up with what was actually happening uh, in the real world. Eventually that changed though. Eventually the real world stopped creating the sort of advances that inspired the Disneyland Imagineers. And Tomorrowland uh, began, began to be really viewed as just having no connection with what was really going out in the real world. And they had a lot of you know, debates on how, how should we change Tomorrowland. They began to, well, maybe we should make it more like fantasy oriented and science fiction oriented. And they chose to make it more like a classic, like steampunk Jules Verne version. Uh, but originally, it just was so obvious that progress was happening quickly that we would be living on the moon and Mars, and we would have nuclear power to everything. Uh, the famous 1964 Futurama exhibit at the 1964 World's Fair presented as the obvious next steps uh, for the United States was to have you know undersea cities and and again you know moon colonies and mile high skyscrapers. So again, progress seemed to be moving so rapidly that I think it counteracted that natural inclina inclination for pessimism. So that, that's a good segue into something uh, that I wanted to talk about. The book has some great characters in it, you know, some great, some great, uh, some great figures. Walt Disney is one of them. Yes. Um, another is... Film producer and creator of the theme parks, Walt Disney. And in the theme parks, <laughs> there are themes. Yes, there are yeah, a variety and of themes. One theme, theme it's is multi, Tomorrowland. It's a, it's a multi There's theme. also Pirate Land. Yeah, Pirate Land. <laughs> Rocket Land, yes. Frontier Land. Yes. So that's yes. great. Yes. Um, another is uh, Herman Kahn. Yeah. Do you want to tell the folks a little about Herman Kahn? Uh, Herman Kahn was a nuclear war theorist. And... Uh, he his he was the inspiration. Real person. He was a real uh, a real, real person. person, not intellectual a character in tomorrow. Think tank? No, not at all. Uh, and if you've ever seen the 1960s film Doctor Strangelove by Stanley Kubrick, there is a mad scientist who seemed eager for nuclear war in that film, and he was partially inspired by Herman Kahn as well as uh, Henry Kissinger. And before Stanley Kubrick did this film, he had read um, Herman Kahn's books. He had, he had met him personally and interviewed him. So he was portrayed as sort of this dark figure of Armageddon uh, from the 1960s. Uh, and then he had sort of a, a second act uh, in his career where uh, by the 1970s, he uh, really became a, a, a futurist, did a lot of scenario planning, uh, was super optimistic about what he called techno-capitalism, what techno-capitalism could produce. And uh, back in the 70s, he, would, he, he wrote that certainly by now we would have mastered the solar system. What's sort of really interesting is that he is an example of a sort of market-oriented, conservative, 
futurist who went, when, he, when he passed in 1983, Ronald Reagan said, Herman Kahn was a futurist who was not afraid of the future. And why it was important to make that description was that by the 1980s, futurists and other people who thought about the future were almost uniformly negative. Again, they saw the, you know, a world of depleted resources, of overpopulation, uh, eventually of uh, you know, a chaotic climate, though in the 70s it was more a new ice age than, than an earth that was going to get too hot. So he really stood out as someone who thought about the future, thought that if we made a few good decisions and voided some bad luck, that it could be a future of great abundance and prosperity and peace. Uh, built around a core of human freedom. This wasn't about a future where the uh, Department of the Future in Washington uh, would come up with a bunch of five and 10 year plans and accurately predict exactly what we should look like. He didn't believe that at all. He thought that human beings uh, empowered uh, to make decisions about their own lives and businesses and entrepreneurs uh, to, you know, to, to be able to be rewarded for their efforts would probably create a pretty fantastic future. So that is really the core of sort of my conservative futurism, though I think, I think you can be you know, positive about the future, whether you're on the you know, left or right. It's a vision that embraces using economic growth and, and technological progress to create a better world, to solve big problems, but one that is rooted in human freedom, uh, liberal democracy, market capitalism, and uh, social mobility, being able to climb the ladder. So those are, I mean, that's what at the core my conservative futurism is about. But again, if you think that we can solve problems, that tomorrow doesn't have to be worse, that we can create a better world, not a utopia, but we can create a better world, then I think no matter where you are in the, on, the, on the spectrum, uh, that you'll find a lot in this book um, to read and enjoy. So Herman Kahn was kind of a mad scientist. And he's a model for you. Do you think of yourself as a mad scientist? Is that it? I don't think of myself as a mad. But what's interesting is that uh, people who know him from Dr. Strangelove assume that he was really kind of this glowering, dark character. But he was, but he was, no, he was a really kind of jovial, upbeat guy who, uh, when he looked at the 70s and looked even you know, what the 60s had produced, saw the potential um, for society. I mean, back in the 60s, you know, economists didn't do a lot of long-range economic forecasting. Uh, he did, and he was head of the Hudson Institute, a uh, think tank uh, in New York State, and their economic forecasts were unbelievable. Not only that we were going to have a forever 1960s, uh, but that we would have an acceleration most likely, and he was hardly alone. Uh, if you look at, you know, you know what the, uh, uh, what the uh, Kennedy and Johnson administrations were saying about growth, he participated in a great conference in 2018 where they had CEOs and think tankers, and, and everyone sort of agreed that things were only going to get better, that even though we were, the Vietnam War had begun and we were starting to see inflation, that we would grow. And then, we, then, sort of, then we, that was like an, a long period of sort of good vibes there in the 50s and 60s. And then we saw another taste of that in the late 1990s uh, with the internet boom. We saw, again, a lot of very, very buoyant forecasts about what the future uh, would hold, both from the administration, from the Federal Reserve, and, uh, and Wall Street. I, I, had, I, have, I, have, I had kept this one report around for over 20 years from, from Lehman Brothers, which they wrote in uh, December of 1990. In your files. In the deep archives. archive. In the deep archive. The physical piece of paper. It is physical. And it was a uh, Lehman Brothers, with, which they were confident that the uh, productivity and economic boom of the late 90s would only continue. And that the only problem was just being able to make sure you fully profited from the amazing growth over the next decade. Unfortunately, Lehman Brothers did not even make it another decade because they collapsed during the financial crisis of 2008 through 2009. So every once in a while, you know, we've had this you know, period of real techno-optimism. And the point of the book is, I want that period again, but I want to sustain it, uh, hopefully through better economic policy and a more uh, pro-progress culture. So I'd love to talk more about what else is in the archives, but I think that might take us <laughs> a little bit far afield from the book. Um, another character in the book, Walt Disney, Herman Kahn, uh, another character is Isaac Asimov. Say a little about say a little about Asimov. You know, there was a time uh, when science fiction authors were highly regarded 
public uh, intellectuals. It's hard to even imagine a science fiction author today who is regarded in the same way that Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov were in the 1960s. And again, during the 1964 uh, World's Fair, um, it was very natural that the New York Times would ask Asimov to write a column about what a, what a, what a World's Fair in 20 years or 40 years might look like. Because he wasn't just someone who uh, created interesting stories about tomorrow, but they were supposedly rooted in hard science and it was supposed to be a science fiction of the possible. And uh, in, in, in that great 1964 column in the New York Times, he wrote about what the future would be like. And it would be nuclear-powered everything. It would be nuclear-powered appliances, the nuclear-powered cars. And that feeling that we had solved this energy problem as the ultimate general purpose technology uh, was pervasive. And again, I can't imagine a science fiction author today being held the same regard as they were in the 1960s. Uh, you got a little bit of that in the 1990s with science fiction. Uh, but now if you had a science fiction author, they would no doubt paint a picture of gloom, uh, saying that we, we had to probably live poor lives, that we needed to move away, uh, away from capitalism, which was, or they would probably say rapacious capitalism. Uh, which was destroying the planet. So if a science fiction author today was given that kind of opportunity to be regarded uh, as a public intellectual, it would no doubt be a message of utter gloom that they would be giving to the public. So when I think about what was different about the 50s and 60s, um, I think about the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And one of the principal motivators behind the American space program was, of course, uh, Sputnik, mm -hmm. and that the Soviets beat us into space, the Soviet Union beat us into space. Do you, uh, do we need an adversary in order to kind of push us further in innovation, in order to push us further um, in uh, scientific progress? Do we need an adversary? Has that been what's missing? Yeah. I, I would like to think that, um, uh, that, that positive images of the future and me pointing out, gee, wouldn't it be great if we already had a universal coronavirus vaccine back in 2020? And wouldn't it be great that if we already had nuclear reactors and 100% clean, clean energy economy, we wouldn't be talking about climate change? Wouldn't that be great? And that will inspire people to, uh, to think differently about the future, maybe have, have different economic policies. Uh, I, you know, I, I think... The example I like to give is, what if last November, uh, instead of it being OpenAI announcing they had created this pr really fascinating advance, this chatbot, what if instead of being OpenAI, it had been Alibaba or Tencent or some other Chinese company that said, we have made an AI breakthrough and the United States is several years behind. Um, if everyone is already tired of hearing about AI, we would really be sick of it because that is literally all we would be talking about. Not just what this technology means, but that the US had lost the AI race. And what did we do wrong? And there would be a panic. And I have no doubt now there would be all sorts of bills talking about we need to increase funding. There's a legitimate AI race. So that would, it would be it's terrifying to think that we were behind, that, the United States, the supposed world's technological leader, had somehow fallen behind. Uh, we are not behind, but yet I think the fear that, that China somehow has figured out a new way to do technology, to grow an economy, uh, I think can be a tailwind uh, for economic policy, for us thinking harder about the innovation impacts of what we do as a country, uh, about our culture. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it has to be, but it certainly, I think, helps to have a sort of a, a geopolitical uh, nudge. And, you know, it used to be the Soviet Union, and now it's China. I don't think it hurts. Uh, let me remind the online audience that you can submit questions for uh, Jim um, using the uh, X hashtag um, that's on the webpage for the event or by emailing Josiah Johnson, whose email address is on the webpage for the event. Uh, and let me uh, remind uh, the audience here in the room to start thinking about uh, questions that you might have for, uh, for Jim. Um, let me give you an argument. 
The argument you're is... And now you're, you're going to play devil's advocate. I'm not going to do that. Got it. You're, uh, you're making people doubt your forecasting ability. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, this is the argument. That I do not proclaim that forecasting ability. I, it's I, not a book of forecasts. There's no, there's no reason to, <laughs> to wander down this path. So our species is confined humanity. to this planet. Humanity. Humanity. Yes, the human race is defined to this planet. Yes. And that puts our species at a significant risk. Could have a big volcano, asteroid could, mm. could, could uh, strike. Um, at a minimum, at some point, the sun is going to extinguish... Uh, itself um, and life on Earth will not be sustainable. And so I think it is a fact, I would say, or at least as close to a fact as you can get without being a fact, that the human race has two potential outcomes. That we have a good run and that the run ends Mm -hmm. on this planet, or that we leave this planet and become an interplanetary civilization. That observation, to me, is enough to motivate concern about the pace of innovation and the pace of scientific progress. Um, How do you react to that? Um, it's, it was, that, that is the argument. I mean, we've talked about sort of a lot of pessimistic Hollywood uh, films right up to the present day. And sort of, that is sort of the argument, you know, from the film Inter- Interstellar by Christopher Nolan, uh, which, uh, which... And let's could, not forget Bruce Willis. In Armageddon, sure. Using yeah. oil field technology to right. drop that nuke in that asteroid. That's right. Well, you know, the main character, Interstellar, says, you know, we were born here, you know, we weren't meant uh, to die here. Liv Tyler puts her hand on the screen. <laughs> yeah, back you know, in Armageddon, right? It's, it's a very, pretty very, good movie. I know you like the emotional thrust of that movie. You got that great Aerosmith song, <laughs> yeah. piping it in, you know. Yeah, very powerful for millennials. Very powerful I, I, film. I, get that, I get that. Very powerful film. Who's seen uh, the movie Armageddon? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, way too few of you. Way too few of you. The rest of you, that's, that's weekend homework for the rest of you. Yeah, well, I'll give you, I'll give you another movie, I'll give you, which I was, just, I was literally just watching Friday, which is uh, The Road, uh, a movie about an apocalyptic that's future. That's less awesome. Yeah, that it, well, it's, it's awesome. Much less awesome. And the, uh, and the, and the, and the disaster what there, I think, Deep is... Deep Impact? Who's seen Deep Impact? <laughs> Deep Impact, hands. Oh, even fewer of you. Morgan Freeman is the president of the United States yep. in Deep Impact. Deep impact. I, for the following weekend. I will point out Armageddon, uh, of course, came out in the 90s. Uh, and so dur- during impact. a very pro, yes, almost the exact same time, a very pro progress era, and it showed indeed humanity being able to solve a problem. Don't tell people with the technology. End of the movie. They haven't seen the movie. No, everyone doesn't die. Everyone knows. It's not a negative movie. Wow, it's fine. That's very bold. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I think that is a I think that is a powerful argument. Uh, I think I might have written more about planetary defense because we're at, currently we are no more capable of protecting ourselves on short notice uh, than we, than we've ever been. I think you, you might, you, some of you might remember a uh, uh, a meteor uh, strike in uh, in Russia about I think it was 2017, which was captured on a lot of dashboard cams, which absolutely, which was a probably the biggest meteor strike since the. Uh, Tunguska blast in the early uh, 20th century over Siberia, and we never even saw. I think we had like 30 minutes warning. Uh, so had it been much bigger, um, who knows what would have happened? But I think that's I think that's really important. Ensuring, and I'm going to sound very Elon Musk like, you know, sort of the light of intelligence throughout the universe. And I think I think as a way of surviving, as I mean. We'll focus in the book. I focus a lot on economic growth and you know what it, what it can do for us and bring people out out of poverty. But solving huge problems that are existential or very serious in nature, whether it is a uh, whether it is a pandemic, whether it is being able to deal with the climate without living worse lives, whether it is protecting the uh, protecting humanity uh, and extending it throughout the solar system and beyond. Uh, I don't think those are insignificant reasons to be in favor of progress and economic growth and sort of the, the degrowth movement that's out there. Um, perhaps they just don't think it's very important that humanity survives, so that's not really a huge factor with them. In fact, they're very much from the, 
uh, an extension of the 1970s movement, which began to look, the environmental movement, which really began to look as, uh, at humanity as just another life form on the earth, as making the earth worse, as a cancer on the earth. So it doesn't surprise me that people who are of the, the environmentalists of the kind who only really view humanity as making the earth a worse place don't really focus too much on these sorts of existential risks because for them, what's really the downside? Um, let's uh, ask some questions. I see uh, a few folks who uh, uh, have some questions they wanna ask. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, before we turn to questions, uh, the rules for questions are that you uh, uh, need to uh, make a statement that if properly punctuated, would be punctuated with a question mark. Um, and please try to keep it brief. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, and please wait for the microphone so our online audience can hear the question. J.P. Hogan, I see you start the book on Tomorrowland, and then you talk about upwing and downwing. I don't know what that is. And not to go into whether, like, the Martian is a throw on Walden as a future. Uh, yesterday, in walking through the FDR memorial, there was a quote about him starting this civilian corps for simple tasks, for uh, moral and cultural values. In the future, are people, does the human race, like now, maybe want a simpler time with less government? And so they're wondering how to have, instead of a national, like, civilian corps, somehow policies that allow them to be more individualistic, instead of, and if the futurism is, going into space as an individual? Are you, are you working individual um, stoicism or uh, how do you, where do, does the individualism go? Yeah, well, I've never, um, before you answer that question, yeah. I've never thought about uh, the analogy between the Martian and uh, Walden before. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good analogy. I um, uh, you know, just think it's an important public service to point out that Thoreau was living on his friend's estate, and so you know he he had a uh, he had an emergency backup plan in case things got rough that I don't think Matt Damon had living on Mars. But uh, it's a good uh, it's a, it's a, it's a good analogy. Now, you know, but the, the question, I just have a, I don't really like Thoreau, so that's <laughs> you know I felt like I needed to say you know that. the um, that's fine. My, my my idea again. Well, I might talk about some interesting things that we might have in the future. It's not, I'm not really outlining, you know, a specific vision of the future, an, I, an ideal vision of the future. Again, I don't believe that we should have a centrally created plan for the future. Um, I believe that we all individually will help create a future that we want to live in. And that can, and that can mean all kinds of different sorts of uh, lifestyles, and I think, that question really reminded me of the film, of the, uh, of the book and TV series, uh, The Expanse, where humanity indeed has moved out into the solar system, and we have moved, uh, we have moved to the moon. Uh, Mars is its own uh, separate entity where people live a, can choose to live a very different kind of life, a more entrepreneurial life. Uh, they, a harder life. It is a harder life. Uh, but they feel that if you want to that Earth has gotten stuck in kind of this malaise where if you really wanted to go out and create something new, you needed to go to Mars. Or perhaps you go out to the mining colonies. The uh, belt. Uh, uh, the belt out near Jupiter. So there were, so the there were different belt. kinds of lives that you know. could choose to lead. Would you, move, you, would you stay on Earth or would you go to the belt? I would certainly stay on Earth. You would certainly stay on Earth. Yeah. You don't like this sort of uh, life of, on Mars. That's yeah. not yours. You want something a little more, well, soft. <laughs> I see. I see. A vicious. I don't think I answered that vicious, question, but that's probably the best I can do. A vicious personal attack. No, you didn't answer the question at all, actually. Uh, yes. Let's wait for the microphone. So the, also the online folks. Maybe I'll answer this question, or maybe I'll just yeah, you know, not be able. To you. I'll do my best. You're rocking and rolling. <laughs> I'm just picking up on the the movie and TV references. Just interested in your thoughts on Star Trek. As was it inevitable that it happened in the '60s amidst the idealism and the utopia and. As a, as a conservative futurist, how do you feel about the, I suppose, the general perception that Star Trek really expresses liberal, progressive values, more of the left, you know, the way it introduced racial diversity in the 60s? Um, some would say it's more of a most communist vision than a, than a capitalist one. That's right. So that's I, an amazing question. Let me explain why it's amazing. Because <laughs> somebody else asked exactly the same question, and it just came through on the iPad here. So this must be something on, on readers' minds. So why don't you... Oh. 
Why don't you try to answer this question rather than answer the question you might, you might like to ask? Uh, it, it's interesting that I, um, I asked this exact question uh, myself of uh, Ronald D. Moore, who was a writer uh, for uh, Star Trek, the next uh, also wrote next Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. I bet you also about, wrote. Uh, he was asking about the original. I know, series. and created uh, Battlestar he's trying uh, Galactica. To, he's trying to keep and, you on track. And I, I asked because uh, Peter. I think Peter Thiel's famous for making this uh, reference that he thought he thought Star Trek was the communist show, and that Star Wars was the capitalist show. Because Star Wars, obviously, there is there there is uh, money, there is trade. And so, so he thought, so that's what Peter Thiel famously said. So what Ronald D. Moore's answer was, they really didn't think about it, that there was obviously money somewhere in the world of Star Trek. Uh, you know, uh, Kirk would say to Scotty, well, that, you know, we're going to, we're, you know, we're going to, that'll cost you a day's pay. And maybe it was just the saying, but that it fundamentally didn't really matter for the vision that that show was trying to create, uh, nor for Star Trek, uh, the next generation. But the future I'm imagining is one of personal economic freedom. That freedom can be that freedom is, has both a political aspect again and an economic aspect. So that is a classically liberal, where you can live the kind of life that you choose to live. It is not an authoritarian future. It is not a it is not a future under the Chinese Communist Party. It is it is it is a, it is a future of freedom that is core to my vision. And right now, sometimes it seems super antiquated, where people seem to have lost confidence uh, in, in in freedom, uh, uh, liberal democracy, uh, market capitalism. But I think it is upon it is upon those things that a better tomorrow will be built. So I, I uh, I'm just going to take a little moderator's license here, if that's sure. a, if that's okay with sure. you. Sure, another one. I um, agree with uh, what Jim said about the importance of free people and, and free enterprise. Jim's answer about Star Trek was uh, completely wrong. <laughs> um, I think it wasn't something that was uh, explicitly thought about all that much in the original series. Um, and then Gene Roddenberry attempted to correct that with Star Trek The Next Generation, where it was explicitly discussed uh, that um, the economics of the future were different, that people were not motivated by the acquisition of wealth or by uh, increasing their incomes, but that people were motivated by self-betterment. And the technology had advanced to the point where the problem of scarcity had been solved. You know, what, what is the fundamental economic problem facing society? Lots of answers to that question. One answer is there's only so much stuff, and how is that stuff allocated most efficiently or most equitably? What Roddenberry saw was a future where there wasn't scarcity anymore. And his, his optimism led to a vision where the absence of scarcity actually led people to lead better lives and to make choices uh, that were better for them and that were better for society as a whole. Another potential outcome in a post-scarcity world is uh, an outcome where people sit around and binge Netflix all day, you know, eat gallons of ice cream, use drugs, get in fights, and, and do all that sort of stuff, and succumb to the lesser angels of, of their nature. Uh, but that's not, I think, what Roddenberry saw. Then, of course, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where Ronald D. Moore had a very important role, uh, capitalism was reintroduced. Um, and, you know, Maybe you would argue it was realistic. Maybe you would argue it was a pessimistic portrayal, but it certainly was not something that Gene Roddenberry would have approved of, I don't think. Uh, so when you write your sequel, you can put that in there. Got it. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Right here on the front. Thank you. Um, so I wonder, when you talk about... Uh, when, when you talk about futurism, people kind of getting disappointed in the future and focusing on the negative, uh, and how people used to dream about moon colonies and things, how much is it that they found that moon colonies and going to Mars was going to be impractical and too expensive, and that we now our development or the frontiers of science, things like CRISPR might just be as you know as amazing as reaching the moon in terms of being able to feed the population and reduce scarcity, 
but they aren't as cool or, you know, they don't make for as good of television. Yeah, well, I mean, we do create media about genetic engineering. Uh, and every, I, I would, I think pretty much all the media that I see about genetic editing and genetic engineering is negative. Uh, you know, you know, Jurassic Park. I mean, I, th I read briefly about Jurassic Park, which, which shows... Great film. Yes. This also is from the 90s. Yes. But when it, did Michael Crichton publish the book? Was that an I 80s think that, book? I think that was an 80s book. It was an 80s book. Yeah. And, uh, and it, you know, obviously it shows... Didn't work out. Genetic editing going very, uh, very wrong. But, it's, but, what's, but in the beginning of that film, there's like a little cartoon which explains how genetic editing works. And that, to me, was a little bit of pro-progress uh, uh, media stuck inside and ultimately sort of, you know, maybe a negative, negative film showing that you can create, like, really interesting content that is sort of pro-science and pro-growth. Because Crichton also said that it was impossible to make uh, optimistic future fiction. And I think that's obviously wrong. I think... Uh, I think and I think Interstellar is fundamentally, even though you know it, it, it's about an apocalypse, is fundamentally um, pro future, future optimistic, and pro progress. One of my favorite examples, which is fairly recent, is uh, there was a TV show based on the book by William Gibson called The Peripheral. And the Peripheral, in the future of the Peripheral, uh, things have gone badly wrong. That by the year 2100, 80 percent of the world's population has died. No really terrible thing happened, just a lot of little things went wrong. A limited nuclear war here, a pandemic here, climate change here. And eventually all those things together ended up, you know, substantially reducing the world's population and, you know, civilizational collapse. But what's interesting is that in the middle of all that stuff going wrong, as Gibson writes in the book, science started popping that they figured out artificial intelligence, that they figured out nanotechnology. But it all just came a little bit too late. So for me, and that seems like a very pessimistic book, for me it would not be hard to view that as actually very much in tune with what I'm writing, which is we cannot wait, we cannot delay. I don't want there, uh, I don't want there to be some disaster that we were just too late in developing the technology to deal with, whether it's the climate, whether it's an asteroid, whether it's a pandemic. Uh, so that's why this book is fundamentally about acceleration. Um, you uh, wrote something or said something. Uh, I wrote this book, is that what you mean? That's, that's certainly... Uh, available uh, now, that's, everywhere. That's, that's correct. Everywhere. At, at the finest bookstore. At the, well, not even, some aren't that fine, but it's, uh, it's there too. Uh, I, and, and, and I don't remember, so, so help me, help me do yeah, what I'm trying do to my think best about. Here. Yes, sir. Something about The Expanse being the best science fiction uh, uh, television show mm -hmm. or the, the science fiction television show that best does something with the book. Can you help me? Well, what's interesting is that The Expanse... No, no, no. Just quick, quick answer. What, what? What am I thinking of? I'm not sure. Maybe someone said, what's your favorite science fiction and you said The Expanse or something uh, like that? I, uh, maybe. I, I like a lot of things. Depending, okay. on, depending on the time of day, I may give you a different answer. Do you have a favorite sci-fi franchise? <laughs> That's the question. Well, a, let me talk about The Expanse. I do like it very much. I like the, uh, the book series. And when I've written about it as optimistic science fiction, people will say, well, obviously it isn't. Just look at it. You know, there was climate change and there's, you know, all these conflicts between the earth and the Mars and the, and the mining belt. Uh, this, is op this is obviously very <laughs> pessimistic. Well, I'm like, well, I don't think so because one, we're still here. And if you listen to some people, most extreme people on climate change, they'll say, well, maybe we won't be here. So we're here. The, the climate has changed, but we're still here, and we're learning to deal with it. Maybe that means building seawalls. Not only are we still here, but we spread out across the solar system. And are there problems? Absolutely, uh, because we're still human beings. As long as they're still human beings, we're not going to have a utopia. But you know what? Uh, the, that world, that world is a wealthier world overall. People are living longer. Uh, you know, even if an asteroid should hit the Earth. You know, there'll still be humans elsewhere. We've developed these, you know, fusion drives so we can get from the Earth to Jupiter rather quickly. 
So to me, uh, that is a conservative vision of the future, which is a better world, not a perfect world, uh, and a world where you can still sort of create and live in the future. You, you have many options of what you want to do with your life, but we're still here. And to me, uh, again, you know, Herman Kahn said, you know, as long as we make a few good decisions, and maybe a little bit of luck will be okay. And that is a future in which we're okay. Well, I think that's a great uh, note to end on, uh, especially given that it is 11 o'clock, which is the time at which the event is scheduled to end. So thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks to everybody who will watch this video uh, in the future at their convenience. Thanks, of course, to all of you who are here in person taking time out of your, out of your day to, to come uh, visit with us and, and learn more about the book. Thanks to Jim uh, for writing this terrific book that's provoking uh, quite a bit of, of thoughtful discussion and commentary. Um, again, just a reminder, not too early to start your Christmas shopping. Uh, certainly not too early to start your Halloween shopping. Uh, Jim, thank you for this uh, excellent conversation. Thank you for thank you. the excellent work you do. Um, and thank you for, uh, for this wonderful book and, and for the conversations that we're all having about it. Well, it was a lot of fun.